Hallelujah. Man, I just sense that God is doing a deep work here. I really do. Uh, from everything I'm hearing from Sunday school to uh, just uh, our testimonies from people, God's doing a deep work. And uh, I'm excited about it. I'm glad. I'm seeing lives change. I'm seeing people change. and seeing fruit. And, uh, and God's good. I'm going to go in chapter 28. I don't know if you guys noticed when you came in back there at the very back, there's a whole box of Purpose Driven Life books. Any of you that want one, get it. Okay, uh, we're in chapter 28. But uh, the prison uh, gave me a bunch of books today that they're not going to be using. Uh, actually, they, they got a bunch of new books in, so they give me all them. There's probably 25, 30 books back there. If you know someone that likes to read and you want to take them a book, take them. I want them to be used, okay? So anybody that wants a book, uh, husband and wife, if you don't get to read together and you want to take one and just take them so they'll be used, okay? But in chapter 28, we're going to talk tonight about it takes time. We've been talking about um, how fight temptation and how temptation comes, but tonight we're going to talk about spiritual maturity. And that's the ultimate goal of every one of us is to be like Christ. Okay, Jerry gets it. That's the ultimate goal of every single one of us is to be like Christ to be imitators of Christ, to do what Christ did, okay? That's our goal in life is to be like Him. Now, that's a lofty goal. It's a, it's a huge goal because now we're never going to be perfect. We can never be perfect, but we can be more like Him, okay? We can take on His characteristics. And tonight we're going to talk about that, but we're going to talk about it in a little bit different way. Um, it does take time to become spiritually mature. Uh, you're not going to get it in a day. God's not going to going to take you down at the altar or it didn't happen this way with me i know he cleaned me up real fast but god's not just going to get you down at the altar and wham bam take everything from you and you're gone you you know he does put a new nature inside of you when the spirit comes inside of you puts a new nature inside of you but as we're going to see tonight you still got all this other junk that you've had for a long time that you got to deal with amen i'll be honest with you to just tonight when i come up here about five and i got by myself I got under conviction a little bit about how I've been sort of hard on people uh, when they got saved and they went out and they, they started messing up. I mean, I, you know, I know with me and Glenna can tell you, when I got saved, I quit cussing, I quit drinking, I quit smoking dope, I quit doing all that stuff. I mean, I quit it. Now, I didn't become perfect. I still had a hot head and I was still a smart aleck and um, what arrogant. What else was I, Glenna? All these other kind of bad adjectives that I was. She ain't want to tell. But, I mean, I still had all those things. But God cleaned me up in her. When I got saved, I got saved. I mean, that's just all I know to say. That's what I tell people. When I got saved, I got saved. And there wasn't no Mickey Mouse around, playing around. They didn't nobody had to tell me to be faithful. They didn't nobody had to tell me to pay tithes. They didn't nobody had to tell me none of that. The Spirit of God got inside of me, and it was easy to do all those things. Okay? So that's why I think uh, that sometimes I'm real hard on people is because I saw the transformation that I make, and I think everybody should be able to do that. Are y'all with me tonight or am I speaking in tongues? Okay, I'll interpret it in a minute, but <laughs> hang on. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 says, Everything on earth has its own time. Everything has its own time and its own season. We need to stay in step with the Holy Spirit. See, if everything has its own time, if we get ahead of its time, we're wrong. If we get behind its time, it's wrong. So it's imperative. It's very important that we stay in step with the Holy Spirit and we don't get ahead of Him and we don't get behind Him because everything has a time, then we need to flow with that time. Amen? Okay, Philippians 1, 6. I love this verse. It says, I am sure. Paul says, I am sure that God who began the good work within you will keep right on helping you grow in His grace until His task within you is finally finished on that day when Jesus Christ returns. I've told you this, and I'm going to tell you a hundred more times before, maybe a couple thousand as long as the Lord lets me stay here. We have not arrived. God is still working on every one of us. I know He's still working on me. He's still working on us. We had not arrived, but the promise is that He will not stop. But this is the problem. People stop. They get frustrated. We're going we're to talk about a bunch of good stuff tonight. But I want you to notice, don't give up. If you're in here tonight, you may have been a Christian your whole life, and you've been frustrated and getting discouraged, do not give up. Everybody say this. I will not give up in Jesus' name. Keep fighting. Don't give up. 
None of us are complete, but we're being completed. None of us are complete, but we're being completed. We're going from glory to glory. There are no shortcuts to spiritual maturity. I've seen people that's gotten saved, and within a, a little while, they're teaching Sunday school classes. They're, spirit, they're, they're, they're growing spiritually, but they still have to go through certain processes. So there's a process to spiritual maturity. Now, I believe that you can get there faster. The more you pray, the more you study, the more you read. Amen? But for most of us, if you're like me, I had to go through the school of hard knocks. I learned from not Harvard, but Hardvard. H-A-R-D. Hardvard. I didn't go to Harvard. I went to Hardvard, the school of hard knocks. There's no, that's, that's just like, you know, uh, when I started trying to lose weight, and I'm still trying to lose weight, but when I started losing weight and I started seeing a difference, then I got excited. When people go and they start working out, y'all seen it before, especially those of y'all that go to the gym all the time and you're faithful like my wife. I'm not faithful, but she's very faithful. She goes three times a week, sometimes four she can, and the rail trail. She's very faithful in what she's doing, and you can tell in her body that she's faithful. But most people go a couple times, and they don't see, they ain't all blowed up and puffed up, and they ain't got muscles like me, you know what I'm saying? And they get frustrated and they quit. And it's the same way spiritually. People will start growing a little bit, but they don't grow as fast as they think they should. And so the next thing you know, they just fall out and quit. Well, I ain't got it, or I ain't good enough, or this person's doing better than me. And that's not the way we're supposed to be. Every one of us are on a different spiritual level, but don't stay there. Don't get comfortable there, okay? You got to keep growing, but it's not going to take, I mean, it's going to take some time. I believe that you can grow faster. I believe in an example that they give uh, uh, in the book was about the tomatoes, 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 tomatoes. But, but he gave a good illustration about that. He said that when they go to ship tomatoes, they can't ship them right because they do their bruise. So what they do is they pick them green, ship them, they, they spray them with CO2, and it causes them to turn green. Y'all looking at your book now, ain't you? Y'all should have done read it. But they spray it, and it, become, and it turns it red. But y'all know that store-bought tomatoes taste like leather. They're hydro thick because they hadn't ripened. They hadn't matured. You take one like John Milburn gives you. Where did that rascal at? John Milburn gives you good tomatoes, man. You cut them things, and they're juicy. They're ripe because they matured on the vine. Same way with a Christian. A lot of Christians come in. They think they're supposed to blow up and do everything in the church, and they haven't matured. They haven't ripened yet. And so what happens? When you throw them into a position, it ain't good. They ain't ripe. They're not seasoned. They're not uh, uh, juiced in the word. They're not, they're not, they don't know what to do. Amen? And it don't work. The same way with those tomatoes. There's a huge difference. Amen? Y'all with me? Listen, sometimes we try to grow or people try to grow too fast. You know, they get ahead of God. And, 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 and I, I, I challenge people to get hungry. But, but I can give you, for instance, there's a guy in the prison right now that he has gotten a line with this guy that's come in. This guy broke fellowship with all the Christians at the camp. He thinks he's got some kind of word from God and that he's different. He's got this new book. I don't even know what the name of the book is. I'd like to burn it if I could get my hands on it. But it's telling him about the third eye and how he can focus on things. And that's how you become to being able to heal people and stuff. Man, the way I read, you pray and fast. That's how people get healed. So anyway, but I sat down for about an hour and a half because I love this guy. And I said, look, man, you need to think about what you're doing. You're getting all this knowledge and all this knowledge. And he's studying four and five hours a day in the library. But if what you're studying ain't good, then you're just studying a bunch of junk. So you got to make sure that when you're studying, that you're studying the right stuff. Ephesians 4. I want to go to the, to the uh, King James and read this. Ephesians 4.13. It says this. It says, till we all. Listen, he don't leave anybody out. So don't think that you are not supposed to be spiritually mature. He said, until we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge. That's what God's been speaking to us is knowledge. To the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Mature. That means spiritually mature. We are all, every one of us, A-L-L. -L. Everybody say all. We are all supposed to come into spiritual maturity. Listen, guys, you can't suck a bottle for the rest of your life. 
Put the Bible down and start eating some food. Get you get into the Word. You start studying to show yourself approved. Amen? But until we get into the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the, of the uh, fullness of Christ, or until we get to the place to where we become like Christ. We are not Christ. We ain't never going to be Christ. We ain't little gods. We are like Him. We're imitators of Him. We do what He did. That's what we're supposed to be, imitators of Christ. What, what would Christ do? What would Jesus do? That's what we're supposed to do. Amen? In Colossians 3.10, it says, You have began to live the new life in which you are being made new. You are being transformed and are becoming like one who made you, Jesus. You are becoming like the Son of God. Listen, he gives another pretty good illustration I'm going to talk to you about for a minute. He uses the, the, the similarity of being a Christian as, as going to like a, an island that the army or, or some military force is trying to take over that island. And what they would do is they would go in and they would do air raids from the boats right in the middle of the toughest place to soften up the army. They would soften them up. And once they got them soft, then they would go into a certain place that they knew they could take, and it was called a beachhead. And they would go in and they would take over, and then little by little by little, they began to take the island over, and they would eventually take, take authority of the island. And that's exactly, he said, that's exactly what Christ does to us. Some of us got bombed before we got saved. Some of us was hard-hearted, stubborn. I ain't got a witness in the house. Some of us were stubborn. Some of you, some of you, you get, I, I feel like I gave him pretty fast. You know, I've done a lot of bad things, but I felt when the Lord really started convicting me, man, I, I, I surrendered. You know, I surrendered at a young age. 18's pretty young, ain't it? And I did a lot of stupid stuff before then. But, but it's like God has to take some people and just get them into awful situations, dire situations, tragic situations before they'll soften up a little bit. People are hard-hearted today, man. People are hard-hearted more today than I've ever seen in my life. It takes drastic things sometimes to get people's attention. And so that's what he does. He bombs away. He uses situation. He uses situations. He lets the devil come in and do things. And he allows things to happen. So we soften up. So then when we get soft, we, hey, you ask Jesus into your heart, and he establishes that beachhead. And then when he comes in and establishes that beachhead, then guess what? He starts taking ground, little by little by little. Some of you, it's a fast work. Some people, hallelujah, it takes a little while. You know, and I'll be honest, the, the, sometimes the more hard-headed you are, the longer it takes. You go around that tree over and over and over. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? I ain't talking to none y'all. I need to do this on Sunday, I know. <laughs> Jerry and I was talking about this today. Today, we live in a world we want everything fast. We want our cars fast, our motorcycles fast. We want our food fast. We want a fast sermon. Y'all don't, but most churches, they want fast sermon. If you ain't out by 12 o'clock, boy, they're going to start fussing. Boy, I got the first time to see somebody do this. They used to tell me they would do this to their preacher. Man, somebody does that to me, I'm going to drop kick them into heaven. You won't have no watch very long. I'll take that thing off your arm and throw it up against the wall. That'd be crazy. They, they said they used to do this to their preacher. I'm like, man, you ever come to my church and do that? Somebody will slap you. Anyway, I don't know where that come from. But sometimes things just take time. You know what? I mean, it just takes time to, to, to mature us, to grow us. He's got to let us go through things. And, and, you know, we didn't get in our mess in a day. And most of the time, we ain't going to get out of our mess in a day. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, it's a process. It's a growth process. God knows how much to give us. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But He knows how much we can handle. He knows how much to give us. He's not going to put more on us than we can handle. And so He grows us continuously. But when we stop growing is when we mess up. Or when we go backwards is when we mess up. Don't stop growing because you don't think you're growing fast enough. Where are you going to be if you stop? Amen? Maturity is a process. We don't need to take the microwave mentality. Everybody wants the microwave mentality. Give it to me fast. He, he, he was talking about how people go into a counselor. 20 years of a jacked up marriage. I mean messed up. He didn't say this. I'm saying it. 20 years of a jacked up marriage. Everything going wrong. You've let it go to pot. And then all of a sudden you won't go and say, I got an hour. Fix me. 
I've had people come in my office think I can fix 10 years of jacked up mess in an hour. And I think I can too. And you know what? If they listen to me, I can. But most of the time, they really don't want to hear what you got to say. They really want to tell you what they want you to say. And that don't work with me, so normally it don't last really long. I, I end up making them mad or something happens and they, you know, we just sort of part ways. Or I send them to Mr. Jerry Campbell. He's a good listener. Jerry listened to him, and where I, I, I ain't got time for it. You, you, if I'm trying to tell you something, if I'm trying to give you some godly advice, and you cut me off and you start running your mouth, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you out of there as fast as I can because I know you don't want to listen, and so you're just going to have to go get bombed a couple more times, and then you come back when you soften up. Is that mean? No, it ain't mean. I've learned. Hard heads make soft bottoms. Sometimes you just got to let them get bombed. Let God keep bombing them. And then finally they say, okay, I surrender. Like we sung Sunday. I surrender. And when you surrender, then you're good, right? Okay, anyway. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 18 says this. Our lives gradually. Everybody say gradually. Our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become more like Him. Our lives gradually grow. You can see it gradual. Sometimes there's a, a huge spiritual growth automatically, and then all of a sudden you start, uh, you know, you start phasing off a little bit, or you, you slow down a little bit, and then all of a sudden, dramatically, you'll, you'll grow again. You know what I'm saying? Y'all, some of you have been there. That's, that's the way it is. Why does it take so long? I'm going to give you five things to talk about why it takes so long. In Deuteronomy 7, 22, it says, God only allowed the children of Israel to gain the promised land little by little. He said, I'm going to let you go into the promised land, but I'm not going to give it all to you at one time. He could have. He, drove, he, he had hornets to go in and drive the people out, but he did it little by little. And I didn't really get a chance. I meant to study this out, but I just now thought about it. But he, he said if he give them the land all at one time, that the beast would come in and destroy them. So the only thing that I talked to Jerry about, the only thing I can figure out is that if everybody was gone, then the beasts would multiply, the, the wild animals or whatever would multiply, and there would just be a few, the, the few that got to go across to the promised land, and they wouldn't get to, to you know, uh, have babies and have more people and all this stuff to go and take care of it. I don't know. Y'all search it out. I'm going to search it out when I get, get a chance. But I don't understand that scripture. But he said if he'd have given it all to them at one time, they would have never been able to make it. And that's the way it is with us. If we get it all at one time, we ain't going to be able to make it. Some of you have been a Christian for a long time and you are still struggling with one thing. Now, I know everybody has a, a bin of iniquity. Everybody has something. But I'm talking about some of you, God has been dealing with you and dealing with you and dealing with you and you're so hard-headed, you won't give it up. Because why? When you give stuff up, it hurts. It's painful. And God's saying, give it up. Stop. I've got something better for you. And you're still not doing it. So we look at the children of Israel and think there's a bunch of idiots. Do you know, every time I read this, the, about the children of Israel and Exodus and stuff, I think they were a bunch of dingbats, man. And now I look at us and I say, well, well dingbats are still around. The first thing is the reason God has to take his time with us is because we're slow learners. <laughs> well, we got to go through things and go through things and go through things before we really get it. School of Hard Knocks, like I was talking about. We're slow learners. We don't, we don't get it the first time most of the time. And so, God, we got to go through it and go through it and go through it. So it takes time for spiritual maturity. Right? Look at the children of Israel. I mean, it took them time over and over and over. And most of them didn't even get to go to the promised land because they didn't listen to what God said. The second thing is we have a lot to learn. Man, there's a lot to learn in this Christian walk. There's a lot to learn in this Christian walk. To be like Christ, to have the mind of Christ, to have the attributes and characteristics of Christ, it's a lot to learn. I mean, I wish it was as easy as a lot as these preachers say, you just give your life to Jesus or say a little prayer and everything else is okay and everything else is going to work out. They're full of bull. They, they are full of bull. Because that is not what the Bible teaches whatsoever. I mean, what about that? Does it, do you see where you crucify your flesh every day? Or you pick up your cross every day and follow him. Where do they get that stuff from that you can say this prayer that everything's going to be okay the rest of your life? They lied to you if they told you that. 
Now, is it the most awesome thing you ever do to give your life to Christ? Absolutely. Will you have more help than you ever have? Absolutely. But you're still going to go through the process of spiritual maturity, meaning you're still going to go through tough times, hard times, and, and, and terrible things. It's just going to happen. That's the way it is. Being a Christian doesn't exempt you from going through tough times. That's why another reason why a lot of people give up because some sliver-tongued, silver-tongued preacher stinking got up and told them when they said this prayer and they give their life to Jesus everything was going to work out and then when it didn't they start saying well I guess I ain't saved anyway and they quit that's why they ain't should nobody be quitting around here because they ain't heard that mess amen Romans 13 2 says taking off the old self and putting on the new self we're supposed to take off that old man that we was and put on a new man but listen those habits those things that you do it takes time to get rid of some of them some of you, it's taking way too long, and God's saying, hey, he's getting ready to throw another bomb. Are y'all hearing me? Don't think God can't throw a bomb. Why are y'all looking at me like that? You dropped a bomb on me, baby. I ain't heard that in a long time. I don't know where that come from. <laughs> Strike that. <laughs> God will drop a bomb on you. He will. He's not playing. See, He loves you too much to leave you there. We talked about it. He loves you too much to leave you the way you are. So if you keep doing what He's telling you not to do, He's getting ready to smack you upside your head. He's going to give you one of my mama's judo chops upside your head or claws, Freddy Krueger. I still got scars. Does God want to do that? Did my mama want to do that? No. Does God want to do that? No, but he's going to do it if you keep going on. I don't know who this is for, but you better get it because you're going to be calling me in a couple of days. God just dropped a bomb on me. I'm going to say, I told you. I mean, it, it is what it is. Amen. See, when we get saved, we get the Holy Spirit, but we don't get everything dumped out of us. It takes time. The third thing is we're afraid to be humble and face the truth about ourselves. I can honestly say this, that I don't, I mean, one of my personality traits, all of us have different ones, there's four different personalities, but one of my personality traits is being brutally honest. And that's with myself too. And so I, I didn't have those problems. I, I mean, I, I, I told too much probably. You know, I was too open and to whatever you know I, I, I knew I was a miserable piece of you know what and that I needed saved I mean I knew that some people think that they're, they're so afraid to let somebody know that they've made a mistake they're so afraid to let somebody know that they committed this sin or they committed this sin or that they wasn't perfect as a child man I'm glad I didn't ever have to live up to that because that would be a terrible thing to live up to amen I think it's time for a lot of people to just get spiritually naked before the Lord. He already knows you. He knows you upside one and down the other. And these things that you're struggling with, totally give them to Him and quit trying to hide them. You can hide them for us. You can come in here every Sunday morning, Wednesday night. You can hide them for us, but there's a payday coming. Dylan, where's Dylan at? Dylan, that thing you put on Facebook today was stinking awesome. Stand up and tell them what you put on Facebook. You got, it. you got it in your heart, don't you? I hope you do. Oh, he's looking for his phone. Look at him. Stand up and read that to everybody. Well, you want me to tell him? I can, I can give him the gist of it. Maybe. What he was talking about is he said, you know, if you had the choice today to choose a bag of diamonds or some cold water in this room, every single person in this room would choose those diamonds. You'd be stupid not to. But if you was out in the Sahara Desert and you were, your tongue's dried up, you, you, you'd have no saliva, you're about to thirst to death, and somebody says, hey, bro, I'll give you a bag of diamonds and you want this big old mug of water. You're going to say, I want the water. And you'd be stupid not to. And the just of it was, there's people today, we're trying to give them a bag of diamonds. We're trying to give them Jesus, the pearl of great price. We're trying to give them the greatest thing they could ever have. But right now, they're wanting the water. I mean, no, they're wanting the diamonds of sin and the water is Jesus. I got it backwards. They're wanting, they're wanting the riches of this world instead of Jesus, the cool water, the spirit. But 
Now today, that's what they say. But when we stand before God on Judgment Day, you ask them, do you want this uh, sin lifestyle, all this diamond lifestyle, this rich lifestyle, do you want Jesus? And I promise you on the Day of Judgment, there ain't one soul's not going to say, I want Jesus. And it was talking about comparisons. Where are you at? What kind of choice would you make? And you better make a choice for Jesus. Amen? Was that pretty good? Is that pretty? Okay, good deal. So you didn't think I was paying attention, did you? We've got to admit that we're weak without him. That's one thing Shelly taught me a long time ago. I am absolutely nothing. All my talents and abilities that God's given me, they are nothing without him. And until we get to that place, we're not going to be anything. Number four, growth is often painful and scary. Spiritual growth is painful because God starts taking stuff that we're comfortable with. He talked about an old pair of shoes. An old pair of shoes is comfortable. They may not look good, but they're comfortable. And that's where our old lifestyle is. Some of you, when you got saved, you drank, you cussed, and you did things like that, and it was comfortable to you because that was your lifestyle. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit starts dealing with you, and he starts saying, wait a minute. That's not my character. That's not what I do. You're not imitating me when you do those things. And you start saying, oh, no. I got to get, you don't realize how much of a crutch they were until you got to get rid of them. Or that person that you're hanging around, they're your friend. You think they're your friend. But when you get saved, you really start doing right with the Lord. All of a sudden, the Lord says, hey, you know, right, this person ain't the best person for you right now. This person drags you down. This person takes my name in vain. This person tells dirty jokes. This person makes you think about things you shouldn't think about. This person takes you places you shouldn't go, so you don't need this person no more. And all of a sudden, you're like, dang, man, that's been my friend since childhood. Or maybe it's a mama or dad that's dragging you down. I mean, I don't know who, I don't know what your, what your stuff is, but I'm telling you, it's painful. You can ask, you, I mean, I keep saying, but you can ask Glenna, when, we, when I got saved, I had to pull away from all of my friends. Not that all of them was bad, but together with me, they were bad. We wasn't, we wasn't, we didn't mesh good. We did things we shouldn't do. So, you know, Glenna helped me a ton, but the Holy Spirit just, we just pulled away from everybody. We had to. Now, later on, Got one here, one of my best friends in school, Gary. He's back, man. He's back. Praise God. But I'm, what I'm saying is, God will give you that stuff back. You just got to sometimes let things go. Amen? Places you go. Maybe it's people that you go see that you don't need to be around no more. Number five, habits take time to develop, so habits are going to take time. Uh, to go away habits define your character your habits define your character if your your if your habits are not pleasing to God then your character is not pleasing to God your character is what you are when nobody else is around if you have to sneak and do things or if you feel oh boy I'm gonna step on some toes right here y'all ready if you're embarrassed to do things in front of people in the church because of what they'll think of you, maybe you need to quit. Maybe that's the Holy Spirit saying, look, you're embarrassed with them. I see you all the time. I'm hanging out with you. I'm supposed to be in you. Some of y'all have heard this testimony before about my brother, and I'm not getting on anybody, so don't nobody say I'm getting on anybody, but this is just what's coming to my, my heart right now. My brother was a chain smoker, pot, and cigarettes. He smoked more pot than anybody i ever seen in my life. He would roll up a whole nickel bag back when a nickel bag and a dime bag was big bags. They ain't now. They say. <laughs> well, I watch cops. <laughs> back when they used to, woo, got caught, didn't I? No, I ain't touched a joint in 31 years. I've smelled a bunch of them. And Dennis is here. That's right. Dennis, Dennis is my school buddy. But uh, can I tell that what happened at time? Do you care just to be funny? You don't care? <laughs> this is before Christ. Valerie, Valerie, don't you slap him. Me and, Dennis, me and uh, Keith went deer hunting one day. 
And we was coming out of the woods, and uh, there was a vehicle up there. I don't even know whose it was. It was Roger's or, or, or Dennis. I used to be real good friends with Roger Hill. And uh, Dennis and him was hanging out together. And I go walking up there, and the windows is up. And it's bow season. It's a little warm out, you know. So they rolled the window down, and boy, that whoom. I was going to tell you, I've smelled it. <laughs> I hadn't smoked it, but I smelled it. But uh, they was in there smoking just a little fried doobie there. And, uh, but he don't do that no more. Praise God. But I, I cried when I left, though. I told Dennis this the other day. We just talked about this the other day. I cried when I left because I love him. And I knew, and I love Roger, and I knew that the devil was trying to destroy him. And praise God, he listened to the Lord, and now he's come back to the Lord, and he's got all that stuff out. He's got a good wife that keeps him straight like me. So anyway, that's a free story. I don't even remember where I was going now. Huh? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I believe, I believe I better get off of smoking pot. <laughs> but Mark would, he would roll up a whole bag, the whole bag, and just smoke pot like a freight train. But when the Lord called Glenn and I to go to Tennessee, uh, my main concern was that Mark and David would get saved. John was in church. Mark and David wasn't you know, wasn't doing real good. So I started going to revivals with them. Uh, they had rededicated their life, but there was some stuff going on. And uh, I told the Lord, I said, you know, I know I'm supposed to go to Tennessee, but I don't want to leave it out knowing for sure that they're going to be all right. So we take off, and we go to revivals and stuff. And uh, one day we went down to the Church of God down in uh, Belmont. And we come all the way back home, and Mark didn't smoke not one time. I didn't notice. I didn't really pay no attention. But about 10 minutes after he left, my phone rung. It's back before you had cell phones and stuff. My phone rung, and he said, man, he said, I want to tell you what just happened. He said, when I pulled back out of your driveway and took off, he said, I fired up a cigarette. And he said, I started thinking, Lord, thank you for not giving me the urge to smoke while Scott was in here because, you know, I just I, I don't want to smoke in front of him. And he said, the Holy Spirit spoke right to him and said, I'm in here with you now, and you're smoking in front of me. He throwed the whole pack out. That's been 20-something years ago. Never touched him again. He stopped at the, at the, phone, at the, at the pay phone down at 66, uh, drive, I mean 66 uh, store and called me and told me that. So I know that God can deliver and set free anything, but it's not easy. It's not easy for none of us. Now, I ain't just talking about smoking, cussing, and drinking. It could be anything. It could be running our mouth. It could be having a hot head temper. God's got a lot of stuff he's got to work on us. But I'm just telling you this. When he says stop, whatever it is, stop. Or he's going to drop the bomb on you. Amen? So just stop. Okay. 1 Timothy 4.15. Let me read this. Paul told Timothy, listen, practice these things. Devote your life to them so that everyone can see your progress. Practice these godly things, these spiritual things. Practice being spiritually mature. And listen to me. I learned this in basketball. Practice don't make perfect. How many of y'all ever heard practice makes perfect? That's a life in the pit of hell. Perfect practice makes perfect. If you practice shooting layups wrong, you just practice the wrong way. If you practice shooting foul shots wrong, you practice the wrong way. Amen? So practice don't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. So perfect practice in the spiritual realm is doing what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Reading your Bible, praying, studying, coming to church, being faithful over what He's given you to do. That is perfect practice. Amen? Y'all should be saying hallelujah. Anyway, let's pray. Lord, I love you and I thank you for this night. I thank you for your word. And I pray that you'd help every single one of us, Lord, to grow uh, more mature, to be more mature Christians. Uh, that we won't be tossed about by every wind of doctrine and everything that goes on. We won't uh, get all upset and been out of shape about it because we know ultimately, Lord, you're in control of every single thing. I uh, love you tonight, Lord. Thank you for this church. I thank you for those that are here. I pray for those that are struggling. I feel in my spirit that some are struggling, Lord, because their spiritual growth maybe is not as fast as it, they think it should be. But, Lord, sometimes our spiritual growth is stunted, stunt or, or, or stopped because we are not doing what you've called us to do. And if there's things that you're telling us to stop 
or things that you tell us to do, may we do those things or stop those things, God, so that our spiritual growth will not be stunted anymore, Lord, but it will grow. And we would be the best Christians that we can be. We can be mature Christians doing the things that you've called us to do. I love you and I give you praise for everything you've done. Bless your people. But, Lord, uh, more than anything, help us to be a blessing this week. Help us to show love where, where people are not being loved. Help us to reach those that nobody else wants to reach. Help us to equip the saints by sharing the knowledge that we have. And, Lord, let us be found faithful when you come back. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, amen. Love you guys. God bless you. And I will see you Sunday morning. Don't forget Sunday school. If you know anybody that wants to, to be in a new members class or get baptized, please let us know. God bless you.